I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the Power 365 show, where I interview staff at Microsoft across the Power Platform and Dynamics 365 technology stack. I hope you'll find this podcast educational and inspire you to do more with this great technology. Now, let's get on with the show. In this episode, we're going to be focusing on Power Virtual Agents and their application in the real world. I would like you to introduce you to my guest today. He's from Washington in the United States. He works for Microsoft as a technical program manager. You can find links to his bio and social media in the show notes for this episode. Welcome to the show, Abi. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on the show. I always like to get to know my guests well before I start. So tell me, what do you do for food, family, and fun? What do they mean to you? Kind of like everything you do outside of Microsoft. Okay, great. Yeah, you started with my favorite topic, food. Uh, so I am a foodie. I love to try new cuisines. And uh, Seattle, I'm where I'm based out, is a really great place to do that. So we have a wide range of cuisines. So I love, uh, since I'm from India, I love Indian cuisine, spicy food. I've been also branching out to other types, like, you know, most obvious ones. Like we have a like, great uh, teriyaki in Seattle and a lot of other uh, cuisines like Ethiopian cuisine or uh, even Chinese and uh, Greek, you name it, we have it. So it's always fun to go around and uh, try to experience new cuisines. So I love that. And uh, next, uh, family. Yes, I live here with my wife and daughter, and we have a four-year-old uh, dog, and uh, that kind of keeps me keeps me busy when I'm not at work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's always things to do there. Yeah. Finally, uh, the fun part is you know like definitely uh, enjoying the great outdoors of uh, Washington State, right? And that is really a blessing, living in this place, seeing these beautiful spots, going on hikes and uh, near the water bodies. So that is one thing we immensely enjoy, enjoy. And in general, I think just the, especially now with the fall has started and we can see the beautiful colors. And uh, nice. always fun to, you know, go around and be in the outdoors. It's good for right. us. Very good, very good. Tell me, what's your journey to Microsoft? How did you, how long you've been there and what have you done in the time you've been at Microsoft? Yeah, so with Microsoft, I've been pretty much like <laughs> right out of the college uh, and I've been with the company for a little over 15 years, but uh, I've been working across multiple teams, different roles. I started off uh, in the uh, engineering role as a developer, then I moved around and then I moved to a program management role. Mm -hmm. And this current role, what I am doing is a very customer-facing role. I'm part of the team called the PowerCat. Uh, some of my colleagues have already been the guests of this show. And uh, PowerCat is a unique team because they are part of the engineering and we help the customers of Power Platform products right, to be successful. Mm -hmm. And that's our charter. And, and uh, we have a lot of subject matter experts uh, who influence the product uh, th through the customer feedback. Mm -hmm. And also we generate a lot of IP as part of the team itself so that we can scale better so other customers can replicate from our, whatever our learnings, artifacts we created for making a particular customer successful. So being part of this team for the last two years, and I personally am specializing on Power Virtual Agents for the last two, two and a half years and part of this team and really enjoying the ride. So tell me a bit about Power Virtual Agents. What is it? And, you know, for those that are perhaps listening and have not used it, give us kind of like how, how do you explain PVA to customers? and the typical applications they use it for? Yeah, I think uh, the simplest way to think about PVA, it's a SaaS service uh, used for uh, building chatbots, AI-enabled uh, uh, chatbots uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, without uh, writing code or writing very minimal code, right? So, so that is basically our USP. It's, uh, we have the Power Virtual Agent product has a very simple, easy-to-use uh, a designer which will help even a business user to go in and without any deep knowledge of you know data science or how the AI models work they can actually go and create a bot and deploy it and that is uh, 
that's what i would say as power virtual agents and uh, it's a great uh, mix of uh, you know the benefits of the saas and mm-hmm. also the easy to use you know experience what we have created so that uh, customers who come in you know, the the organizations who have only business users who are really subject matter experts right they can come in and then just uh, stitch up a conversation using the tool and then actually create a bot for their own purpose. So what are the elements that make up a chatbot? Like, you know, is it purely just a question and answer situation mm-hmm. where someone just asks a specific question and a keyword and that triggers a response or is it more advanced than that? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. Like uh, when we look at uh, chatbots, right? Like uh, it's gone through a re- evolution in the last uh, few years, I would say. And uh, when we started off, I think uh, one of the most popular products in Microsoft uh, when it comes to chatbots was like the Q&A maker chatbot, right? like, mm-hmm. where you have this, uh, what we call as the singleton FAQ type of chatbots where you ask a question and then the chatbot gives an answer and then uh, the user gets the information. Right. So, mm-hmm. so that was like one of the most popular ones because people thought, well, instead of putting it in a FAQ page, why don't I just expose it in a chatbot so people can ask the question to the chatbot and directly get to that. So, right. Instead mm-hmm. of scrolling through the page or trying to find out where the page is and things like that. So that is, uh, that's a great thing. But then as the chatbot evolved, right? Like now we are seeing that uh, more and more customers want to build the actual conversation experience which similar to like how you want to talk to a human right Mm -hmm. so it's like uh, the we want the chatbots to be smart and uh, context aware so that uh, when the user comes and talks with a chatbot it's not always giving a canned response but depending on the user's response it is able to take them to different topics show them different information or even perform like self-service actions and also be intelligent to know like when it's not able to solve the issue, it's actually escalating or transferring the customer to a human agent so that they can continue to get help. So that's what we are seeing in the market that chatbots are like becoming smarter and the customers want that capabilities. Right? So, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, so we- most of the times these uh, chatbots are like a extension of the customer's brand, right? So they're mm-hmm. putting it mm-hmm. in their website and it is... If the chatbot is not smart enough uh, or if it's not able to perform like the basic operations that reflects poorly on the brand as well, right? Yeah. So, so it's a very visible component of the organizations as we see it. So. Yeah, that's that's an interesting way to look at it. That is a brand representative when it's in that public domain. You, you mentioned the word there, context aware. How does context awareness work or could you give us an example of it in, in PVA? Yeah, so uh, PVA has a lot of... Uh, inbuilt features through which you can uh, get this context awareness, right? So one simple use case is like when we have this concept of uh, PVA working with the Dynamics 365 Omnichannel, right? So we have a first party integration, out of box integration of the product with the Dynamics Omnichannel. So Dynamics Omnichannel is the agent help desk engagement hub, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where the human agent receives the various chats and then replies to them. So now we have this option of passing context variables in the PVA. So what that means is like you could potentially collect information from the chatbot, like the user's problem or the or the user's name or any specific information you want to collect from the user. Mm-hmm. And then when the, let's say at some point, the bot is not able to solve the issue mm-hmm. and, uh, and it wants to, and the user wants to escalate. So now the bot is escalating the conversation to the human agent on the other Mm -hmm. side of the omni-channel, right? So now without the context uh, awareness or without the context variables, the the human agent might have to ask the same questions again to the Mm -hmm. uh, user to find out what's happening. But since we are passing this uh, context variables uh, capability, we are having this context variables capability and we are passing this collected information as part of that, so the the human agent is going to get a very clear picture of what was the issue and everything which is passed as a context, right, mm-hmm, directly. Mm-hmm. So that is one uh, straightforward example of how we are doing it. And even otherwise, context variables, like you know, we have uh, bots uh, enabled as part of Teams, uh, PVA bots, which can be mm-hmm. built as part of Teams. So there you we have the same concept, like some of the input, inbuilt information about, like, for the example, the user's name or email or department, mm-hmm. those things can be pulled directly from, let's say, the uh, Active Directory and then surface to the user, right? So that's 
the the bot becomes more smarter and smarter so that's one way to do that and uh, another key important feature like what we have in terms of uh, entity and start, slot filling where uh, you can configure the bots or design the bots in such a way so that you can have your own uh, either system entities or custom mm-hmm. entities like date so that whenever the user types let's say an information up front as part of his initial query right you know i want to know the availability of let's say a black bmw or something like that right mm-hmm. so so some of these entities can be set up in such a way that you can avoid reasking some questions like you the bot can be smart enough and understand that okay you are already mentioning the car's uh, color mm-hmm. the car's uh, model right yes. or probably the year so mm-hmm. that the subsequent questions where you will have to ask okay what is the car's model what what color car do you want all that information can be collected as entities and the power virtual agents uh, a model does this thing called slot filling right mm-hmm. and then it automatically fills those information and helps the user to skip these redundant questions right and mm-hmm. then directly takes them to the uh, import the relevant uh, message or the relevant uh, part of the conversation so these are some examples of how you can use uh, context awareness and yeah i can keep going on because there is yeah, yeah. <laughs> so many applications of how we can do this <laughs> this is good tell us about integration what options are there available out integrating into other data sets that the organization might have yeah so the simplest easiest way for us today we have extensions through like power automate and also the connectors ecosystem right mm-hmm. so the whole power connectors so we have around 700 plus connectors as part of this ecosystem and you can pretty much pull data from using any of these uh, 700 connectors uh, using a power automate uh, action which can be incorporated as part of the pv that's one popular way of doing it there are also other ways like historically customers have used to like other extension points like bot framework skills and used a skill bot and then you can actually call a skill bot from a pva and then continue the conversation or get some information or access data sets tap into like the business a- apis and all those things mm-hmm. and and a bot composer is another way to do that with the http connection you can actually it that specific api endpoints collect information from there these are the most common ways people try to bring in the data from the various sources and and so what about where does ai play a fit is it possible for me to you know create a an ml model that i can then provide to the chatbot as well or, or how is or is ai fitting into the mix in any part of what you can do with pva So PV has that uh, unique feature here in the sense like we have a generic uh, AI model which is which serves across multiple tenants right when you say multiple tenants across multiple customers right yes, so yes. it's a mm-hmm. pre-trained pre-trained model optimized for customer service and most of the customer service business related uh, words and semantics so there is no real need for you to actually go and tra- train the model for your topics so the mm-hmm. expectation is you give a sample set of trigger phrases for your intent or topic and then mm-hmm. the model is pre-trained enough so that it can identify what you are talking about when the user comes in with the user query the model based on these trigger phrases will be able to match the right topic so the need for you to actually have train the model from the scratch uh, like uh, using a custom model is uh, is no longer required in the uh, in the pva scenario so mm-hmm. so that is the unique advantage but having said that there are also customers who say that in spite of the generic model they might want to augment it with additional uh, ml capabilities like in they want to have their own custom models mm-hmm. so in that case they can use the like the extension points which we just talked about right like uh, you could potentially use you know a luis model and then call it uh, from the pva from the fallback and if the if the a if the power virtual agents uh, generic model is not able to catch it then it will mm-hmm. go into the fallback and then the luis model in your which is configured in your fallback can do the auxiliary intent matching and to find out like if it is able to resolve it and if not uh, then you can decide the experience so so there are a few ways to do that so where, where does search come into it and and what i mean is that using pva to let's say search a repository of information and provide it back so let's say internal stakeholders so this is not public facing mm-hmm. but 
let's say I needed to, and, and what I'm asking for here is, is this possible? Or have you seen something like it? So I'm wanting to search or query data that might be, for example, sitting in SharePoint as a data repository. Is that possible? And like, say, you know, hand back, here's a PDF document about what you just asked for. Is that type of, is that supported? Yeah, so that is uh, supported. I mean, think about that kind of, let's uh, let's play back that scenario which you just mm-hmm. talked about, right? Mm-hmm. So in this particular use case, basically the user might come and say, let's say, you know, I want to learn about, let's say, podcasting, <laughs> for mm-hmm. example, yeah. right? And you have a document on po- po- podcasting somewhere in, uh, in the SharePoint. So the mm-hmm. when the user makes that query, the maximum response you can potentially give is a single turn response right you may you mm-hmm. will be able to look into the chat point and throw one link back saying that okay go read this topic right? yes so this is really not a if you look at it it's really not a conversational experience it's an faq experience so the faq the challenge with the doing faq experiences you know extensively using pva Mm-hmm. Or for that matter, any any such tool which is more uh, optimized for a multi-turn, actual, real conversation uh, building experience, right? Because the more and more FAQs you just create, like typically if you look at uh, FAQs in, you know, tools like Unimaker, they run in like thousands of pairs, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. The, the maintaining of those... Uh, FAQs, the integrity of those triggering fr- trigger phrases become more and more complex. Right? So mm-hmm. you need to become, your model needs to become like uh, more and more sophisticated and uh, and uh, to be able to always pick the right uh, topic. Like, so if right. you have even a slight overlap, it might not give you the right. Uh, yeah. So, so you can definitely do it. In this case, how it will be like is you could, we have an inbuilt feature called suggested topics. You can use that feature to mine the SharePoint page mm-hmm. or, uh, or, or indirectly you can actually export it to an Excel or a document and then mine it. And then it will create you the singleton question and answers. Mm-hmm. And you can do that. But uh, the thing to keep in mind is the more and more it becomes larger, you'll have to maintain the trigger phrase uh, integrity so that you can maintain the a good yeah. uh, triggering performance. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. The other way to do that is you can use the PVA more for the actual conversational multi-turn experiences, which involves more complex actions and uh, more uh, back and forth conversations, right? And for these kind of a single turns, you could uh, use the fallback and use your existing uh, Q&A maker or custom Q&A, which mm-hmm. already has that repository. So that you need not reinvent the wheel. You just can extend your PVA bot to pull the information from your uh, Unimaker and display it in PVA. That's good. That's good. I like it. I like it. Tell me, in in your experience with working with the various customers as part of the CAT team, what are the, if I could give me the top five use cases that that companies are using without mentioning the company names, what are the, the most common use cases that you're seeing Either publicly, in other words, outside the firewall, where where a customer is using a PVA to engage with, it, with their customers, and then the other one, which is where organizations are using it, maybe as part of HR or part of you know internal processes around you know how do I find a policy on travel if I want to travel you know overseas, for example, based on my mm-hmm. location. What are you seeing? What what are the typical use cases for PVA that you're seeing in the market at the moment? So this is a very interesting question because, you know, we, uh, I have worked with a wide range of customers mm-hmm. across different verticals from retail to, you know, like hospitals and, uh, uh, you know, like uh, tech companies, right? Doing the customer service or mortgage mm-hmm. companies, you name it. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now it's uh, now like according to, so what I would say is it really depends, like depending on that uh, customer's business process, they might choose to automate different things as part of the PVA. But there is one common thread across all these customers, right? One thing is, is what we call as the deflection or the deflection rate. Yes. So most of the time they are talk, thinking about how to use the PVA bot to deflect the customer users, uh, reduce the call volume so that uh, the bot can deflect the incoming chats to the human agents so that the human agents can be more efficient. 
right? So I think that is the common thread. So mm-hmm. having said that, what they have, what they do for that is they always, most of them always start with their existing data, with their existing call transcripts from their call centers. So this I'm talking about the public facing bots, right? Yes, yes. So they always look into those existing data signals to see like, where are the areas, like it's a, always a, we have seen it's like an 80-20 approach. Like mm-hmm. most of the times it's that 20% of the use cases which generate the 80% of the call volume, right? And they so see like what are the most highest call drivers, like for what are the customers calling about? Yes. And then they see like how do we build the topics for that? How do we add more self-service actions for this so that the customer need not actually go and talk to a human, but get the get their own thing, uh, get their uh, answers uh, directly? And then mm-hmm. the important thing is uh, like, uh, what are the channels that the bot has to be, depending on where the business typically interacts with the customer? It could be mm-hmm. WhatsApp, or it could be web channel, or it could be like, you know, like Facebook Messenger, depending on their needs, right? So, yes, yes. Uh, so, so those are the key things. And uh, language is another factor, depending on the geography and the customer base. Language might be another things. So, this would I would say will be like the outer uh, skeleton of uh, when you are going to look into the use cases. So, you will have to the customers usually make sure that they have these right signals before they jump into the actual use case per se. Mm -hmm. And I would say at a very high level, the common use cases which I've seen across all these verticals, most of these verticals, uh, maybe some of them may not be applicable for some specific specific verticals like, uh, you know, like health agencies and things like that. But Mm -hmm. for most uh, organizations, questions about uh, their, uh, like uh, their services, right? Like, uh, it could be a, if it's a retail organization, like a, what is their return policy or shipping policy or those kind mm-hmm. of information, right? And same thing like uh, if it is a service-based organizations, things around like service SLAs or uh, cancellations, those kind of things. Yes. So all that policy information, they try to, all the, what are the services available, all that information the companies typically use to use the chatbot to surface that because that's an easy start right so you can mm-hmm. you already have the content you just have to create the conversation the topics and then you can get to go and uh, after that um, the other big piece what i've seen with the customers is around uh, depending on whether they are like a service company or a retail company or a product company right if it is service company like scheduling is a big uh, component customers uh, mm-hmm. uh, love to use chatbots for uh, because otherwise they have to actually engage a human to do the scheduling, right? Like, uh, so they love to use the chatbot in this case so that they can uh, use the chatbot for uh, scheduling. And uh, mm-hmm. in the retail context, uh, uh, if you look at it, checking the shipment, uh, shipping status, like the order status, right? Order history, mm-hmm. those kind of things are very popular across different uh, retail companies. And uh, Across all the companies, account management is another uh, key use case. You can see that uh, a lot of cu- companies uh, don't want the customer to call the call center to reset their password or do something else, right? So mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so they want to enable all those things through the chatbot itself. And uh, other key thing is about the billing and payments. You know, if they want to, the customer wants to make a payment through the chatbot or check what is the payment history, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what is the monthly billing if they want to change it, show them the invoice. All those things are also a very popular use case for uh, uh, these kind of uh, external facing uh, CX uh, bots. Yeah, and, um, yeah this, these are the top things which come to my mind now. It's good. It's good. Last question I have for you is around return on investment. You know, when when a customer is justifying putting in PVA, mm-hmm. I can see a, a big factor in that would be that deflection rate, right? If you can yeah. deflect a call going to a human person mm-hmm. that could, you know, last a period of time, that's that's a tangible dollar reduction that you can do if you can deflect it because you've answered this question a million times already and you can do it through a low cost channel like PVA, right? Electronically. Mm-hmm. Are there any other kind of levers that you think of around ROI where there's, you know, the, the cost to benefit for the customer you can demonstrate? 
Yeah. So, you know, we talked a little bit about the public facing bots. I didn't get to mm-hmm. the internal bots, but uh, yes. the thing about the ROI is, right? The ROI is different for public facing bots versus mm-hmm. internal bots, right? So you, you rightly said that uh, most of the times the deflection um, rate is the one of the key components in the case of public facing bots, it's not going to the human agent, it's handled by the bot itself. Right. So, mm-hmm. uh, whereas in the internal facing bots, like let's say teams are building for their departments, like you for uh, benefits or uh, benefits bot or things like that, right? Or, uh, mm-hmm. or HR mm-hmm. department is building a bot. So, there it's a slightly nuanced approach where we have seen that it's not only uh, the ROI of, of uh, uh, deflecting from the human agent, but it is more about uh, the cost savings. Uh, through uh, the perform the improvement in the performance right like mm-hmm. the number of hours saved for example you know a, a, a company could automate the whole process of getting a employment verification letter through the bot right so that could have saved them like you know the 10000 man hours for that yeah. particular year and that yeah, means yeah. it uh, it is bringing them to a significant amount of cost savings right so so and then the speed of uh, getting that thing done right so all the slow the efficiency factor plays in like what the bot handle time like Mm -hmm. probably uh, earlier they used to take like two days to get the whole thing done end to end now with the bot they can get it done within like within minutes let's say Mm -hmm. right so that could uh, count so they're talking about not only the dollar figures which is obviously the most important one and the most uh, that we are also talking about the efficiency with which the task is done, the number of hours uh, saved, and then how much it is improving the human agent also. Because mm-hmm. if the bot is effective, it has. So in call center, we uh, in call centers they have a very important uh, metrics, uh, what they call as uh, TTR, like the time to resolution, right? Like right. Uh, yep, yep. so that is like. Uh, which kind of says like how long, how efficient that human agent is, right? How long it took for him to go and uh, figure out the problem and provide a solution. So now if you have a bot, which is like efficient, which is giving him a lot of context information and handing off a lot of uh, good information for him to finish the, to provide a resolution faster, right? So that's improving the productivity of the human agent as well. So so there are different angles. uh, You can look at it in terms of the ROA. It's not only the dollar amount. Mm, this is good. This is good. Abi, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on. The pleasure is all mine. Thanks, Mark, for having me. I love to talk about this and I'm so glad I could share my experience with this audience. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show from Microsoft, please message me on LinkedIn. If you want to be a supporter of the show, please check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365 guy. How will you create on the Power Platform today? Ciao.